infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Welcome to another episode of Into the Fray. If you're new here, I hope you're enjoying it enough to head to your podcatcher of choice to rate and review the show. This helps it aggregate across the listening platforms, which will turn into more people willing to come on and share their encounters. If you've been listening for years, I'd ask that you please do the same. Home base for Into the Fray is IntoTheFrayRadio.com. There you will find all episodes, blog posts, and get bonus content info. Speaking of that bonus content, on top of the free weekly show, I also produce bonus content for Patreon and Apple Podcast Premium. On either platform, you get all bonus audio episodes and early releases, each one ad-free, of course. Full disclosure, though, Patreon has a bit more in the way of perks because of their interface. Over there, you will get video versions of patron-only chats, e-private Discord channel, and merch at certain pledge levels. So head to patreon.com slash into the fray or your Apple Podcatcher app to sign up for bonus content today. You can find me on the big three social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The Linktree link in each of my bios will take you to all the places you want to venture regarding ITF, including small town monsters documentaries, various ways to listen to the show, Beyond the Fray books, contact info for me, and more. And lastly, and really honestly, most importantly, if you'd like to share your encounter or encounters on Into the Fray, the best way to get in touch is by emailing me at shannon at intothefrayradio.com. And without further ado, let's get to the interview. On this episode of Into the Fray, I welcome Luke Phillips back on with me. He is an author out of the UK who, now like many of us, has an utter fascination with cryptids. His recently released book, Rogue, is his fourth fictional work, and this one is set in the forests of Washington State, where strange killings and missing people absolutely baffle law enforcement as to the culprit. And hint, it's not a bear, guys. His other books have been centered on big cats, you know, the cryptids that, especially over there in the UK, they're going, oh no, those aren't out here, but we know they are because people have seen them. And then he and I have also had conversations in the past about things like the infamous lion duo, the ghost and the darkness. And something that you brought up in one of your emails to get this scheduled, Luke, was the passing of Tom Wilkinson, which I had not even realized happened. And he was in, of course, the ghost and the darkness. Welcome back. And that is actually a really sad passing because that's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that lovely welcome, Shannon. And yes, unfortunately, Tom Wilkinson, the actor who played him on in The Ghost in the Darkness, so the infamous British industrialist who originally propositioned Colonel Patterson and asked him to build the, the 
railroads. Unfortunately, the, uh, the actor has passed away. Very famous for things like The Full Monty and the Second Great Marigold Hotel and a f- you know, lots of English character and period dramas. But yeah, a really great actor. From a personal side, I always wanted him to play Fairbanks, the, the villain in, in my cat books, in the first, first book, Shadow Beast. But yeah, uh, I think he's, he's known and, and loved by many and will be, will, will be missed. So yeah. Beaumont is not a nice fellow. Beaumont did not care what was going on out there in Africa. He just wanted that damn bridge built right now. Yeah, I think that's pretty much, yeah, yeah I think he pretty much played a typical you know, British industrialist of the time, which was, you know, get the job done at any cost. And as he, as he fondly tells Val Kilmer in the film, I told you you'd hate me. So. <laughs> and he did. Yeah, I think a lot of people ended up in, in that position because he kind of just turned the, the blind eye. And for anybody that doesn't know, The Ghosts in the Darkness is based very, very heavily on, I mean, I don't, I'm sure that they don't know exactly how some of the attacks went and all that that are portrayed in the movie. However, The Ghosts in the Darkness are two lines that actually killed many, many people. Was it 90 something people was the final total that they killed? Yeah, it's, it's debated quite hotly. So the Savo man eaters, as they're known. Now, the original accounts by Colonel Patterson, you know, from the late 1800s, he claimed that it was 137. So 137 of his workers were, were claimed by an man, which was roughly over a 10 month period. Now, given that they were two male lions and that they were feeding almost exclusively on humans for most of that time, it's certainly not within without it's well within the the realm of possibility there was a number of tests done on the skins and the taxidermid specimens which are in the chicago field museum to this day and they say that the results are more like something between 25 and 35 people just based on the isotopes that are left in the skins but these skins are not in great condition. You know, Patterson used one as a rug for many years. The taxidermic process in itself is very, very destructive. So the, even the fact that there are indications that, that, you know, from the chemical traits that have been left in the skins show at least between 25 and 35 people, I think it's not a huge jump to suggest that it was actually quite a lot more. So, yeah, they were notorious man-eaters of their time. And and still to this day, the only man-eaters that were ever discussed in British Parliament. Rightfully so. I mean, their their reign of terror was... I, I You know, I can't even imagine going through something like that. I, I don't know what the wages were back then and considering someone like Beaumont being in charge of such a thing, I would imagine he wasn't paying that well. So then being almost nearly forced, I think at some point it seemed like some of the workers were to be there and to lay your head down and go, well, hopefully I don't get ripped out of the tent tonight and eaten alive. Oh, that was a huge aspect of it. I mean, yeah, certainly none of the workers, which were a mix of Indian uh, and African Muslims and Hindus, they, they were certainly not well paid, although at the time Britain was leading some of the charge to abolish st- slavery. There was almost certainly some slavery in, in, in terms of the African t- tribes and things like that, having their own slaves, which were almost certainly involved as well. So, yeah, there was there was lots of bad things going on on that railroad. There was no health and safety, something like. 30% of the workforce at any time were not working due to injury. So, yeah, it was a it was not a, a pleasant place to work by any means. And then to add to that, pretty much on a weekly basis, you know, one to two people were being taken from their tents. Terrifying, but incredible movie. I watch it every so often. It's on, on the rotating list of things I can just watch over and over again. That's definitely on that list. Well, let's talk... Before we speak about maybe some British cryptids and what's been going on out there, what have you, you know, sniffed out over across the pond, let's talk about Rogue. Now, first off, what will hit you when you look Rogue up is the cover art, which happens to be done by Mr. Sam Sheeran. Yeah, Sam has absolutely 
smashed it out of the ballpark and he's been incredibly patient with me you know when I was asking him what we could do what we wanted to do even just you know getting him paid he's he's been an incredible friend and very supportive and but it was always a dream you know that when I wanted to do a Bigfoot book Sam was the artist that came to mind and Sam was the guy I always wanted to do the cover art we had like one or two conversations about what we wanted working creatively I know that it's horrendous to have somebody dictate to you what should be on the cover. So I, I pitched a couple of ideas, but said I very much wanted it to be his his thing. And, you know, he absolutely smashed it out of the ballpark. You know, it it's a gripping cover. It gives exactly the idea of what you want to do, that the, the cover art suggests a scene that even happens in, in the book, so which he did not know about that. You know, so really, really, really in, in instinctive artwork from Sam there, which is amazing. Oh, well, look at that. Intuition coming from Sam. He didn't know he was psychic at all. I'll have to talk to him about that, you know? I know, exactly. See, yeah, yeah. there was some, some real hints as to, to some of the other things that go on, including a mystery cryptid that turns up. Uh, you know, there's some, some suggestive imagery on the back cover that, again, he didn't know that, but it, it, you know, it can be used interpretively very well. So it, it all worked very well for me. Yeah, because the idea of a rogue, when we talk about a rogue Bigfoot, you know, the the idea of Bigfoot families and they're they're just trying to mind their business for the most part. They're not trying to go and poke the hairless things because it brings more hairless things. And we're bad news, which we are. But the idea of a rogue means, well, he's gone rogue. He doesn't give a crap. He wants to go poke the hairless things or maybe take or eat or kill or whatever he feels like doing. And I imagine that's the the basis for the book, right? It is, yeah, there's there's a couple of sort of reasons why I went with that total with that title. And you know, part of it is, you know, being a monster movie fan, you know, in, in Jaws, the, the shark is described as a rogue. But yes, in particular in Bigfoot circles, when we talk about rogues, we're not normally talking about these family um groups that, and, and these Bigfoots that, which are tend to be, you know, sort of you know, have known that that lesson is that you keep away from humans, that it attracts attention and trouble. I think generally it's accepted that these those types of Bigfoots tend to be younger ones, whereas in my book, I wanted to give my rogue a particular backstory. So not only is he an older big bigfoot he's 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 an alpha and he's a, he's a, you know he's a, he's an elder bigfoot with a lot of experience um he's had a bad run in with humans um but he's also learned that hanging around humans presents opportunities to feed uh, and things like that which again is reflected in a lot of the law in a lot of the encounters that, that, that you know that we hear and I wanted to sort of build a story around that in particular but there is a family group in the story as well there's lots of law and legends that you know Bigfoot connoisseurs and Bigfoot those who are Bigfoot fans would, would will be able to pick up on you know I wanted to be as true as possible to Bigfoot fans because I'm one of them and uh, you know I wanted to do do the story justice well I kind of like the idea of a Bigfoot that's just he's just had enough you know and he's just going to show everybody how enough of all the everyone's you know what that he's had so I I'm I have not finished it. I have I have started it. I've I'm always like reading six books at a time. So I'm bad I'm bad in that way. I should just focus on one at a time. Thank you for sending me a copy, by the way. It is a beautiful oh, you're book. You're and, very welcome. No, um yeah, I mean he is very much a Bigfoot with uh you know, not not just a bad attitude, but yeah, he has had enough. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, he's had a rough ride and he's got the, the you know the merits and the skills and the attitude to do something about it so so it's really yeah it's 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 a really interesting story uh, i wanted to make it biologically sound although as i say there are some elements into it which you know suggest otherwise but yes it's a, I, I i i yeah i really wanted to do the subject justice no, it's set in Washington State, which of course is the classic "quote unquote" Bigfoot mecca, right? Even back in the day before the things exploded on the internet and all of that, if you said Bigfoot, most people would go, "Oh, well, they're they're uh, actually they would think they were only in Washington State." But did you was there a list that you had narrowed down from? Was there any other locations that you were considering for the setting of the book? 
Yeah, there were. I mean, Washington State, I think, given, as you say, it is pretty much the Bigfoot mecca. I think exactly, as you said, if you look at a lot of the early reports, you know, even Peter Byrne, you know, one of the four, four horsemen of Bigfoot, he said that he, he discounted any Bigfoot stories or encounters that happened if it took place east of the Rockies. You know, because he, as far as he was concerned, it was, you know, a West Coast phenomenon, pretty much restricted to Washington, Oregon and California. Obviously, now when we look at the Bigfoot map, we can see it happens all over the United States, you know, from east to west, you know, real, real interesting things you know pop up like oklahoma and ohio in particular you know some of these states which you wouldn't think are particularly productive in terms of bigfoot encounters and sightings are actually really prolific so there were i i did have ideas about maybe going midwest i haven't done a lot of midwest stuff in the past and it's it it, it obviously presented lots of ideas in terms of settings and particular scenes things like that I also seriously considered starting in the South, you know, so having a, you know, Louisiana sort of New Orleans skunk ape, you know, skunk ape even possibly going down that. And, but as I worked on the story, I, I, I felt that actually that was where I was going to go with the second story, you know, once I get around to writing it. And then, yeah, basically it was a choice of California. Or, or Washington, and uh, in the end, I, I, I ended up with Washington um, because just it, it does seem to be the home of Bigfoot, and it, it was the place I think I felt I needed to start. But boy, is there an awful lot of other places to to to, to, to look at, and you know, a lot of myths to sort of you know sort of challenge really, you know, because when you look at the data, things crop up. Like we we tend to associate you know Southern Bigfoot with being more aggressive, whereas mm-hmm. actually. The most aggressive encounters actually seem to come out of British Columbia and Alaska. And we also associate, you know, with Southern Bigfoot, we tend to say that they're smaller. Whereas actually, if you look at what researchers are producing, it looks like that, you know, Southern Bigfoot are some of, you know, there was a Bigfoot in Kentucky, which I think is actually the the, 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 the track way is actually the biggest we have. And yeah, and that's in Kentucky. So, yeah, so there's lots of things out there contradicting and, and, and you know, perhaps poking holes in, in some of the, you know, sort of the, the exceptions we have about Bigfoot. And, and certainly one of them is that they're not just found in Washington, but ultimately it was where I wanted to go with it. So. Now, I'm not going to take this any further than, than you want to, of course. And before we recorded, you kind of told me what you've been up to. But I wanted to toot your horn for you because of the fact that, and I again, I won't divulge anything you don't want me to, but your work is in relation to wild animals. So you're not just an armchair researcher like many of us, like myself, that just gets online and you look at reports and you like Bigfoot and you like the, the UK quote-unquote cryptid cats and all of that you actually work in this. So I just wanted to throw that out there for everybody. If he sounds edu- educated in, in, in things like this as we move through this conversation, it's because he is. So I just had to say that. Oh, no, that's, that's very kind, Shannon. Yeah, I mean, I studied zoology at university, so and zoology isn't the, the study of, of you know zoos or, or how to work in a zoo. It's the study of animal behavior, animal systems and, and species. And I work, yeah, I work directly in, in wildlife conservation, you know, including big cats and you know some of the most threatened mammals on on the planet so you know we i get updates and projects from projects across africa and asia and beyond and you know we work yeah work directly with them i'm very lucky to be involved in the field that i am i don't know if i asked you this question when we talked about the savo man eaters but i mean this is a pretty dark question and i don't maybe it's a stupid question but if that event happened again today and especially with the work that you do, if you were invited to go to a place where something like that was going on, even at a quarter of the level, let's let's take it down a notch because maybe maybe the first way is a, a flat out no, which would probably be pretty smart to say. But what if it was going on to any level, a quarter of the level is it was going on and for the ghosts in the darkness, taking people, killing people. Would you go out to a place like that, you know, considering the fact that you have this fascination with the big cats, if you had a chance to you know, study behavior of, of these rogue cats, as, as they might be called? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the thing is, I mean, a few years ago, I wrote an article called The Modern Day Man Eaters, 
and because man eating isn't you know and again despite the sexist connotations of man eating especially given that in most cases it's actually women and children who are taken but you know the people eating is is something that animals have not given up by any nods of the head you know so it does still happen there are specific areas you know so for instance in Tanzania you know there is still a significant issue with man eating in terms of lions in particular delhi in india you know has issues with with man eating leopards still you know wolf attacks in romania and eastern europe still happen quite on a regular basis same with bear attacks although it's much 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 more you know less likely you know compared to big cats and, and, and wolves in particular but yeah it still happens and yeah, if I did have the opportunity to go out and have a look, which it, it, I actually may do, you know, in my current work at some point, human wildlife conflict is one of the biggest things that we actually look at and spend our resources and and, and time on, um, because it, it it does happen, you know, and, and and still does happen. Did you see that horrific video of the car? It's a white, I think it's a white car. A woman gets out. They are inside of a safari park. And she's pissed at her husband and she gets out of the car and walks around to his side. I don't know what the the point of that was, but then a lion comes in and drags her off and he tries to fight off the lion, but I don't think that he was successful. I don't know if you saw that video, but sometimes you get on Twitter and things just get in your face and you can't unsee them. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very flippant remark, but sometimes you do see things like you see these National Geographic or you know, or sort of you know, not National Geographic, but other channels, you know, where they yeah. create, they create these anim- these programs like when animals attack, and they could quite as easily be labelled, you know, when humans are stupid, um, yeah, you know, because anybody putting themselves. It's interesting. I've just just been listening to your the Bigfoot in Alaska episode, and you know, as your guest there pointed out, Mother Nature will regularly. If you give them an opportunity to, to, to point out that, A, you're not the top of the, f- the food chain uh, and B, you're part of it, she'll, she'll, get, she'll jump on any opportunity you provide. And the moment you could go one-on-one with an apex predator, the likelihood of that going well is, is very, very bad. It is very, very slim. I like that chat with Fred because Fred, you know, he's not – I mean, listen, the, the – the paintbrush was from his ancestors was that they were all bad. And he, he kind of was like hinting like, Hey, I was giving them a chance. And then of course he, he admitted, Hey, I've told this story a million times. And I was like, I get it. You know, I, you, anyone that wants to go find his encounter can even on his own YouTube channel. But he was saying, I gave them a chance and they screw, you know, they screwed it up because they, they came in and I thought that, it was a group of them that it was like an Abe Canyon situation. They thought they were going to die and they weren't doing as far as he knew anything wrong. So yes, I mean, then that's look, that's the basis of your, your newest fictional book, right? Is because these, these experiences do happen to people and no, he's not saying every single Bigfoot is bad. Every single Bigfoot wants to drag you in the woods and eat you or hit you against a tree. But in his experience, He's, he's going to be armed. He's going to make sure his head's on a swivel because he's had bad experiences with them. Yeah, and I think, as he pointed out, Bigfoot is a very different animal to the apes that we know. You know, you're not going to have this Jane Goodall experience of, you know, touching fingers and a silverback turning to you and giving you a, an infant to look after. Most of the time, the encounters that we have are are actually pretty terrifying they're normally bad they're normally instances of people being escorted out of territories being subject to power and intimidation displays and if not being directly threatened by bluff charges and things like that none of these could be you you know shaking of trees and things like that none of those can be described as behavior that we would consider benign or 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 gentle or accepting you know these are very strong territorial you know sort of behaviors and it's one of the things that i wanted to explore in the book as well because it's it's interesting you know just from a point of biological dynamics when we look at the average you know bigfoot in the books in my book 
I have deliberately made a, a, a large individual. You know, so the the two alphas that are in my, in my books are ten and ten and a half feet tall. And one of the interesting things is that when you start looking at how that translates to physical strength, just something that's actually twice our size is actually four times as heavy and nearly eight times as strong because that's how biological dynamics work and 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 how biophysics works you know it just in order to stand up and support itself you know things multiply on a scale that we wouldn't necessarily imagine and that correlates with so much that we hear about what these cap- these animals are actually capable of and things like that so it, it gave me you know a real playground to work with in terms of what they could do what they were what some of the the feats that they were capable of in terms of strength and terror and how they sort of attacked and things like that but again a lot of it is based on encounters that have, have happened and you know allegedly in real life I want to build upon what you said and something that Fred brought up a couple of times which I'm going to use going forward he and again he said it a couple times which I I think in his mind he's like going I have said this because it, it it is very true and I never thought about it this way but much like you said you know if they're shaking a tree or just take it take it as they're just peeking at you from around a tree it is such a large creature and especially if maybe you didn't even think they were real and now you got this thing quote unquote staring you down even though it's just looking at you no matter what they Fred was basically saying no matter what they do it's probably always going to come across to a human being as being aggressive I, I totally I totally agree and but the thing is is we, we are kind of spoiled by sort of TV and media in general because we see these these things like Jay Goodall and David Attenborough and interacting with gorillas and orangutans and things like this. And it looks really benign and peaceful. But the amount of work that goes into creating that situation and enabling it to happen is is significant. I mean, in most of these places, like the mountain gorillas, for instance, it takes two days to get to them. You you can't just turn up and park in the car park and walk up to a, a, you know the visitor center. It it's a two day trek into the Rwandan jungle to to find them, and they might not be there. And then you have to wait around and potentially bait them and get their attention. And if you are not with the people that they recognize and trust, you are in trouble. We've got to remember that actually a lot of the things that we see on that, you know, on sort of wildlife documentaries and programs, it, it's not or even then a real world event because actually the event you would get if you were on your own and walking into their territory is very, very different to what these people experience. You know, it, it's very rarely that you get these trusting, gentle giants that would just accept you into their territory. You know, it, it wouldn't happen in the real world. Yeah, and it's too tough for me now to watch, but Gorillas in the Mist is an incredible movie, but you can't watch it without crying. I don't care who you are. You would have to have a stone-cold heart to not cry in that movie. But I forget how long it took her to get to that point, you know, where she could get that close to those those gorillas. But incredible, incredible story. And, And you know what? The work goes on out there, and, you know, you're mentioning the people that are supposed to be there that know the gorillas. Like, God bless those rangers that they live there, they're from there, and they walk around with semi-automatic rifles to protect those gorillas. Like, they're just angels on Earth. Well, I mean, it, I mean, it is, I mean, the Rwanda, in the, the gorillas in particular, it, it is heartbreaking because so many of those rangers lose their lives, you know, yeah. um, to perishes and conflict with terrorists and political uprisings, you name it. Diane Fossey obviously was killed by a poacher, but 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 so many in her who have followed in her footsteps have you know met an untimely end due, in similar circumstances, and that happens for wildlife rangers all over the world. You know that happens to you know tiger rangers, lion, you know people protecting lions across Africa. You know we've got this horrendous illegal wildlife trade that is going on, where predominantly Asian markets are being supplied by sort of poaching in it and things like that and things like rhino horn and you know tiger bone and lion bone and we're now in the ridiculous situation where there are so few tigers left in the wild that 
because lions are are almost indiscriminate to tigers, you know, at bone level, lions are now being poached and 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 killed off as a substitute, and, and then being sold as tiger bone in Asian markets, mm. you know, because they, they they've run out of basically run out of wild tigers, you know. So it, you know, there's more there's more tigers in captivity in the US. You know, than there are in the wild. In fact, there could be more tigers in captivity in just Texas than there are in the wild. I had really. no idea about that. That is, that's horrific. It's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. You know, I'm telling you, I've said it before, and it might sound really dark, but a good apocalypse that only affects humans is in need. I'm sorry. We just, we suck. We really do. We're, we're not very, we're not very good at this. It, it, you know, if we're protectors of the planet, we we, we kind of we kind of suck at it. <laughs> Let the animals have it back. You know what I mean? Just we we had our shot at it. We're screwing it up. We're we're not doing a great job. <laughs> no, we're yeah. not. All right, let's let's switch gears. I want to know if anything new has come across your path. I mean, it has been a while, I guess, since we've spoken officially in ITF. So, what kind of reports have been coming out of Britain? I know how pun intended, I guess, Harry, you can get to be talking about Bigfoot reports in Britain, right? That's a subject of high contention in the Bigfoot world. But have you had any Bigfoot reports in the last few years? So there are, they do crop up, particularly in the north of the country. So in Northumberland and Scotland, and, you know, sort of, we, we do still get, you know, people talk about encounters with things they can't really explain and in particular bigfoot creatures they tend to they do tend to fit more into what might technically be called a wild man or you know or what is known you know in in european legends as the wood woes you know so if you if you look at a lot of english cathedrals and grand buildings you might see a strange looking hairy bearded man with a staff which is Technically, a woodwose or the green man, you know, slightly different legends, but the, you know, the, the woodwose in particular, you know, which is a, a sort of a wild man of the forest. And yeah, we, you know, there was an encounter not too long ago reported in Loch Ness where a hiker got scared out of the woods. You know, he was, it, 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 with all these things, it could always be a case of they, they, they pump themselves up to so much that they get scared and, you know, the, they end up scaring themselves rather than a potential incident has happened. But experienced hiker, certainly not uh, a believer in Bigfoot and certainly not a believer in Bigfoot in the UK, distinctly got the impression they were being shadowed. If you walk in the woods in Scotland in, in, in winter, it's, it's, it is a very dark, foreboding place. So it's easy to scare yourself, but they, they didn't complete their intended hike. They backtracked out of the woods as quickly as possible. They were seeing shadowy figures behind trees. And again, they, they distinctly felt that it was an animal rather than you know something supernatural. But again, they couldn't quite put their fingers on it. Bigfoot was what came to mind. You know, they were talking about guttural growls and things like that. It is an it is an interesting one. Obviously, the reports we get most of the time are, are things like the big cats, but we 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 get all of the supernatural stuff as well. You know, we get we, we get reported man encounters. We get fairies and gnomes and you know all sorts of things you know reported. And obviously, our folklore and mythology goes back you know, centuries. And many people are very firm believers in, in these things. So yeah, there's a there's a plethora. Where I am in the southeast, we've had some very sort of, you know, interesting big cat reports, um, or actually little cat reports near me, for instance. I'm based in the southeast in Kent, and we've had some livestock killings which do not look like they're dogs. They, it looks like it could potentially be a lynx. So yeah, it's always a, an interesting hot pot of sort of stuff that comes across the desk as such. But yeah, the Bigfoot one definitely proved, you know, is, proves controversial. The only thing I would say is, that, so a lot of the things that people say, so for instance, people say that, you know, it's just a small island and there isn't enough space for, for these things. But we there is... We, there is significant space in the UK. A lot of the UK is rural. You know, Scotland in the Highlands, a lot of you know rural Wales, even the southwest of England. You know, we're talking rather significant tracts of land. A lot of which is private. A lot of which is wooded and forested. We have a, a deer population of at least six deer species. You know, which 
you know, could act as a food source along with, you know, a feral population of wild boar and other animals which could potentially fit into the food chain. You know, so it's it's not outside the realms of possibility, or as always, that back when we had a land bridge to Europe and, and beyond, if these things are walking around and they seem to be walking around every single continent other than Antarctica, um, you know, because we get reports from China and Russia and Australia and obviously the US, um, then why why couldn't they be here again in very small very small numbers? I love me some little people slash gnome slash leprechaun stories, whatever label you want to put on them. They fascinate me. Okay, so you you mentioned Dogman out there. Can you recall one or two? you know, encounters, how those went down and, uh, you know, what, what the folks were doing where they saw them? Yeah, so there was, there, there is a, there is a, a myth about, so, you know, of, of, a, of an upright canine sort of creature that can visit those of Irish descent, you know, when they're near death. And one story that was shared on a podcast called BBR, investigations was an elderly man i think he's based in scotland but i'm not sure actually but certainly in the north of the country was basically he was you know he's 80 years old he had a carer in the house he'd moved his bedroom from upstairs to downstairs and the downstairs there was no curtains at the window and he basically was woken at night to see something peering in at the through the window at him interestingly enough he said that he didn't feel that it was aggressive or or or, or had any Ill, Ill intent for him he he just suggested that actually it was quite surprised to see him there and that normally there were curtains there it, it had the opportunity to look in and then it saw somebody was actually there and awake and you know and had observed it and you know again the investigator who was involved you know asked him if he was of Irish descent which he was they identified an area of the property which they perhaps got bad vibes from and you know sort of one of the things that was sort of tied to this myth was that he had recently contacted the solicitor to, to talk about his will because you know he he was reaching the you know sort of the or or was at least contemplating that he was probably in you know the, the last few years of his life and should you should have his affairs sorted out so it was interesting that that came about when he was thinking about you know making a will he has irish descent and there is this legend and mythology that is associated with those of Irish descent and, and this sort of, you know, death wolf, you know, for want of the modern name. I mean, that's kind of fitting for at least, you know, where I go with Dogman, and I think that's where you go too, right? Maybe this harbinger of something, much like a Mothman, or something just eh, a little bit more supernatural than flesh and blood. Yeah, I mean, I I I I love the idea of the dogman phenomenon. I I know they're different, but I I have a, a an absolute love of werewolf movies. There's you know, I, there there's something that terrifies me but fascinates me at the same time. It, I, all the things that it sort of identifies, and yeah, whereas it, it's interesting with Bigfoot that you know, like even to the point in the book where I was I was able to justify the Bigfoot's physical characteristics like having, you know, basically natural Kevlar because of its musculature. I gave it the ability to thermoregulate so that it could, you know, appear and disappear off thermals and things like that. These are all things that happen in the natural world. And that even if it's just very, very loosely, I can build a case for and justify. When it comes to Dog Man, an upright walking canid, I think we're I think we're beyond you know saying yeah it's it's a coyote that's led to walk on its hind legs or you know something like that you know there is it it just appears that there is something clearly supernatural going on in terms of what people experience the fact that they get there's all these aspects like people report things like getting this ominous idea of threat and evil from them uh, and then that the, the, the dog man appears to take great pleasure in in scaring them and frightening them, but doesn't necessarily, you know, they, they seem very malevolent. They seem to have an agenda. 
they also seem to turn up when people are perhaps doing things they shouldn't do, perhaps misbehaving. They tend to turn up where people are camping, when they're littering, maybe when they're close to an Indian burial mound, these sort of aspects. And again, it is something you know, that I, I do like to explore and, and like to look at and you know, have into, into that in my fiction. So, it, yeah, but it, yeah, I, I think we really struggle to justify dog man on a, on a flesh and blood biological basis. Yeah. That's a though with the upcoming second doc on dog man, the dog man territory, werewolves in the land between the lakes. We went out there and we talked to all kinds of folks, of course, that had varying degrees of terror in relation to these things. As you say, this feeling of dread sometimes, which can happen prior to you even actually physically seeing this creature, like this primal instinct kicks in, or if it's something that comes off of the the dog man itself. And then, of course, the people thinking that, well, I mean, if, if they are supernatural, why didn't it just poof disappear when, you know, at, at some points and even in the last film, it was like there was these things being shot at and they're, you know, they're just running away like a normal creature would. So you're kind of going, well, couldn't it just poof out of existence? But maybe once they're here, there's rules for them. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the yeah, I think once they are exactly that. I mean, obviously, we're talking about a complete the unknown entity we, we don't know right you know, what, what we're, we're just going so but that that does mean that you know it it's it's everything's to be played for in in terms of that we we don't know what the rules are we all we seem to know is that exactly as you say obviously from the very first reports of the beast of Bray road you know these things have been seen hunkering over roadkill you know apparently eating and scavenging so that suggests physicality you know obviously we've had encounters where people have described you know damage to their vehicles like scratch marks and things like that in the case of the lbl obviously probably what the most infamous you know dogman encounter ever in you know in terms of the murders in 1982 but also the incidents that happened before that you know there was this lone hiker hunter who was apparently torn from his tent a, a couple of weeks before the, the you know the camper incident and things like that and you know hike free hikers which were in a camp and they i think they were chased in a pickup or a camp or again a Volkswagen camper bus but you know that you know again there's there's more than one collaborative story you know sort of showing that actually you know there is something to talk about here and particularly in, in the land between the lakes which, you know which has just become infamous and so many researchers go in there and talk about ominous feelings you know um, about um getting a bad vibe or you know i think there's you know i i i know some of the, the researchers like kumbo sort of you know, get, get you know ha- attract controversy but you know he's talked about a dog man in that area called the witch who or the grinch you know who is very aggressive towards you know people and and things like that so you know to this day 40 years later we're still talking about land between the lakes and potential encounters and frankly terrifying things you know in that area Luke, you mentioned in your area of Southeast Kent that there have been some recent livestock killings and that it's probably attributed to a lynx. Now, do the powers that be deny that those exist there as well, or is that denial only reserved for big cats? No, no, they're they're blanket in their denials of of what's going on. What's interesting is that, like with the livestock killings, we we do get a a big share, you know, almost all livestock killings in the UK happen to are down to dogs you know dogs that are loose dogs you know so for instance in exactly the same area where we've had the livestock killings which is about four miles away to me you know earlier in the earlier last year we had livestock killings where basically two mastiffs got into got into this area and killed two sheep um but as i sort of explain in my first book you know shadow beast we we, i i discuss of livestock killing and and actually the way a dog kills is very very different to how a cat kills there's been a really good documentary come out in the last year called panthera britannia and that shares some incredible game cam footage which you know i think pretty much 
show shows a, a mountain lion following a deer which appeared on the same game trail you know moments before so I, I think we now have some really incredible evidence that there's big cats here but links you know there are back in the 1980s we had a farmer actually in 1990s sorry we had a lynx that was shot and killed by a farmer in Gloucestershire and a gamekeeper who actually was prosecuted for bird of prey persecution and they found a lynx in his freezer which you know which he had not reported to the authorities because he thought he would get in trouble which was you know ironic that he then got in trouble for killing birds of prey which actually is illegal so yeah it, it, yeah it's it's it but what's been really interesting about the, the the livestock attacks recently is that one somebody thought they'd seen a small deer called a muntjac and the area that we were in we don't necessarily get muntjac here but also it would be very difficult for a muntjac to get into that area and munjack are quite small they're you know reddish brown in color uh, and they have you know a lack of tail which pretty much describes a lynx or thereabouts and you know the livestock kill that happened which was a sheep it was a very clean kill you know the uh, sheep had asphy asphyxiated so you know when we found it the eyes were in the back of its head the tongue was lolling out the farmer who knows a dog kill when he sees it was really difficult about it. He didn't want any publicity. He pretty much knew it was a cat. He'd seen a cat kill before. He didn't want any publicity. He didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want the press to know. And basically, you know, wasn't didn't want me to take pictures. Didn't want to do anything. But wanted eyes on it and wanted confirmation that it was a lynx kill. That's really something else. Two shot dead. I mean, they're one of them's like still chilling in the freezer, and they're going, "Oh no, these don't exist here." Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, as I say, the the documentary Panthera Britannia that came out recently has got probably some of the best evidence in terms of game cam footage and even some thermal footage that it is very very hard to deny. I mean, again, when I started looking at you know these sort of phenomenons in the UK, when I started looking at in my general purpose was I wanted to disprove that there was any possibility that there were big cats in, in, in the UK but, but it was all you know sort of mistaken identity and things like that and it was whilst I was at university that I was exposed to footage you know like thermal footage from a police helicopter which clearly showed a lynx walking beside a motorway uh, and then again you know get some really really good um evidence you know encounters you know people describing what they saw as i say we've now got dna evidence you know a study that is being ongoing study that is being conducted by the college of agriculture which is doing a tooth pit analysis on prey you know there's some really really significant evidence here showing that big cats are here and are active and again you know there are very dedicated groups here doing exactly the same as you guys are out there, taking plaster casts of Bigfoot, of prints, of footprints and things like that in the words of things that cannot be explained. Why was the guy killing the beautiful birds of prey? Did he have a small dog that they kept going after or something? No, so it's it's one of the things we unfortunately again encounter in the UK where we have game estates where they're raising birds like pheasants, quail, mm. grouse in particular, and gamekeepers are encouraged, you know, even to this day, even though it's illegal to kill and shoot birds of prey because the birds of prey, right. you know, feed and or, or, or will go after the game birds, particularly if you keep a whole bunch of game birds in a pen that they can easily access, you know. So, yeah, even though it's illegal, gamekeepers use things like pole traps, which they put bait on top of a pole and then like a bear trap, it closes and uh, traps and kills a bird of prey. They also shoot them, you know, just generally outright shoot them. They'll poison carcasses. So, you know, we've had in the last few years, we have, so in England, for instance, we have a very rare bird of prey called a hen harrier. Absolutely gorgeous bird, really beautiful to look at. At one point we were down to six breeding pairs and, all of that was down to persecution. It was down to you wow. know, the big, the big private game estates. There were gamekeepers going out, or, or you know, and you know the lads and ladies of the of the world going out and shooting these things because their idea of sport is shooting 
animals for fun. So that's awful. Is their population back up now? Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. I mean, hen harriers again. Again, they do very well in Scotland. The England the English um, population is recovering, but still very, very heavily persecuted. You know, it is a, a significant fight that is by no means over. But yeah, the reason he had yeah he, he, yeah, he was you know, doing birds of prey. It, what's interesting is it's illegal to shoot birds of prey, but because lynx are not an identified animal in the UK, it wouldn't have actually been illegal to shoot the lynx. So <laughs> so the, the thing he was worried about reporting, he would wouldn't have gotten in trouble right. at all. And the stuff that he was doing, you know, illegally, you know, was shooting birds of prey or killing birds of prey. So. I just looked up the hen harrier. That is a gorgeous bird. I would probably myself, as you know, I have, I have parrots, but uh, I, know. I if, if, if I could afford it, if it wasn't tens of thousands of dollars, and of course, if I didn't have parrots in the house, it wouldn't mix very well, but I would I would completely be a falconer in a second because I, I follow several of those accounts on Instagram. I'm just uh, fascinated by that. Yeah, there's some, I mean, gorgeous, I mean, birds of prey, I, I mean, you know, again, raptors and, you know, they, they are amazing, amazing animals, you know, Peregrine falcon, fastest thing on the planet. They, 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 you know, they, they, they really do sort of, you know, conjure up awe and majesty when you look at them. And we, we're, I'm very lucky that again, there's a, a really good falconry place down the road called Eagles Heights, and, and they, they are a rescue and rehab centre, and you know, they, they do some incredible work. And but they've got everything there from Stella's sea eagles to, to, you know, to the smaller falcons. And yeah, they, they, it's never a bad day when you encounter a. a you know, a, a, a bird of prey. And again, I'm very lucky in Kent, in southeast England, you know, we have a an area not too long, not too far from me, which is known as, you know, Raptor Island, because it's really great for watching birds of prey, including marsh harrier and smaller birds like merlin and things like that, which, you know, get incredible encounters watching them from there. So again, we're very lucky in the UK. We do have these incredible expanses of wilderness which do support incredible wild animals, but yeah, they might just support something else in, as well. I definitely think that, and that's where we'll go next for a little bit more of that. But before we do, yeah, I in my backyard, I've got uh, four, probably 60, 70 foot pine trees. And when the hawks come in, I know the moment they do, because all of my parrots, they let out uh, horrible screeches and all of them go f- flying off of their cages, you know, because if, if I'm home then they're outside of their cages doing their own thing i just have to make sure nobody fights which does happen but yeah yeah, the second a bird of prey comes into the yard i am highly highly aware of it and even though you know these guys know hey i'm in a house but i still don't feel that safe and actually a couple of times a couple of the younger hawks that don't quite understand yet have dive bombed underneath the awning and come close to you know enough to get right up to the window to try to get at my parrots and that really gets everybody upset but at least they haven't to actually hit the window at this point but yeah the younger ones are not figuring out the glass yet because the older ones know well I can't get in the house unfortunately for those little tasty treats those colorful tasty treats that Shannon has in the house yeah it's quite well slightly macabre but quite funny is that there's there's a you know, so peregrine falcons, same in New York City, but also in London, are one of those birds of prey which have pretty much taken over, you know, have adjusted very well to an urban setting. And a few years ago, when they were analysing what the peregrine falcons were eating, in one of the pellets that they found, they found the beak of an African grey. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I bet. Um, yeah, because obviously an escaped pet or a pet that had been allowed to fly, which unfortunately had you know been taken by by one of the pa- by, by one of the peregrines. So yeah, it, you know I, I can imagine that you know when they see something exotic like that sitting around, you know is it. But what's really interesting is you talking there as well about how your birds react in the presence of a predator, and again so so often hikers and things like that talk about this idea of the ecosystem just basically shutting down and going quiet and and, and what you've described there is exactly how an ecosystem reacts when you get these warning cries and then everything goes very silent very quiet and hides Um, and obviously you know your birds are reacting because they can't and also as parrots they play a role similar to crows and, and and things like that in in alerting the rest of the ecosystem that there's a predator around so yeah that's really interesting to you know for me to hear so 
the poor doves, though, sometimes I wonder about some of their brain power because the, the hawk will just be sitting in the tree and they'll just, they'll come right in. But the smaller birds and some of the other, like the grackles and things, the bigger black blackbirds, compared, mm. comparatively to a sparrow, they're, they're not anywhere around. But those poor doves, they're like Larry, Larry Curly and Moe or something. They're just like, ah, da, 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 da. I'm just going to get in the bird bath here. I'm like, dude, you, you may not, you may want to rethink that, that spot that you got there because there's death incarnate a couple of branches above you. Yeah, there's quite a funny, again, macabre funny bit of footage that was shared with, you know, from a London peregrine can where basically a peregrine was on eggs, you know, in a nesting box, an open nesting box, and a wood pigeon lands on the same ledge and literally walks up to the the box and unfortunately just spends a little bit too long working out that the strange grey thing inside Mm. the box is a bird of prey and and gets, you know, and and ends up being, you know, a very quick and easy meal for the the female peregrine. But yeah, sometimes you do wonder about about pigeons and doves about yeah, and the, the intelligence they've been blessed with some more than others i guess that's a, why they yes. call it natural selection right yeah absolutely <laughs> all right so uh, what, well, what other interesting things have you come across in the last few years and maybe for you know researching for the books and things yeah i mean there's been i mean as i say there's been i, I do feel that there, there has been almost sort of post-COVID or, or during COVID that there did seem to be this massive increase in just animal encounters generally. Big cat encounters, again, do seem to be on the increase in the UK. Quite regularly now, you know, we're seeing, again, large black cats being you know, sort of reported. I suppose what's interesting for me is is the variance in the descriptions, because again, if you sort of you know, want to sort of go into the murky waters of whether they're flesh and blood animals or not. What's interesting to me is that obviously if if they are black leopards, which you know we presume the vast majority of them are, then they would have the rosettes that a leopard has because you know a, a black panther is just a melanistic leopard or jaguar. In the UK it's very unlikely to be a jaguar, it's much more likely to be a leopard because that's what was being sold at the time through Harrods and places like that. But whereas most people, or, or no, most is 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 too ju- is is a big assumption. At least a few of the, the reports describe these creatures as having jet black coats, suggesting that they are perhaps something different, um, or something a little bit more unusual. Now they could be hybrids. They could be uh, they could be hybrids of anything from large jungle cats um they, they could be crossbreeds which have resulted in giganticism in in some of the feral cats because we have a large population of feral cats in the uk which could be creating these you know unusually sized large black cats which are jet black in color but it's yeah it's an interesting road to go down and again unfortunately it's one of these things which that there is no absolute answer for but it, it, it you know and it, it conjures up on you know more more questions and answers unfortunately but when you when you start looking at the actual encounters and the descriptions they don't always marry up perfectly with what we understand to be the the biological specimen that you know as i say they don't match a black leopard all the time and they don't match a mountain lion all the time so that's that's something interesting Again, uh, 2023 was a great year for Nessie sightings. So I think we had more Nessie sightings, you know, in 2023 than the last 14 years previous. Obviously, again, our friend Sam Sheeran did a, did some great work in in debunking perhaps what was quite a famous you know image, which was clearly a superimposed toy. But again, there's been some really interesting video footage, some of which again can be dismissed as unusual wave or, or sort of waves meeting in the middle of the lock which is a known phenomena but yeah yeah lake you know there's a, a lake north or a lock north of Loch Ness which again has started you know has always had a monster legend but because it's so inaccessible and people can't get there it's kind of a local legend but again that's made the news relatively recently yeah there's there's been sort of all, all sorts of interesting things going on you know so yeah everything from lake monsters 
little people i can't remember a specific incident that i've i've looked at but again it, now that they're on my radar i mean other than that there was a great film that came out last year called unwelcome which focused on red caps which are one of my again one, one of my favorite legends you know which is you know a sort of a uh, a, a particularly nasty type of Irish and Scottish goblin, which got its reputation for dyeing its red cap, you know, red again in, in human blood. So yeah, that came out last year. So it was great to see red caps, you know, sort of featured in a, in a Hollywood film and such. So yeah. I was very proud of Sam for taking out the big red debunked stamp on that because that image was going absolutely viral everybody was resharing it here's the proof we needed he's like hold, hold my beer essentially let me let me show yeah. you what exactly this is so he did an incredible job and every once in a while it crops up and there's always someone right on there going no no no, this is not this is not a, a, a real a, a real image of a plesius or or a moses or whatever yeah. the, the label was for that in the in the I onset think- and I think again, what I think what's sad about it is because you know even channels like Lad Bible were, were, were sharing that post, and I think people forget about and you've encountered these people you know and and, and have uh, sort of you know uh, interviewed them and there are people out there who have dedicated their entire lives to researching this kind of phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. You know, like so, there's a very famous Nessie researcher who you know basically gave up his corporate life sacrificed his marriage you know and has spent his entire life on the shores of Loch Ness researching and keeping a vigil on the waters you know and maybe that's not the healthiest of examples but there are people out there who experience these things and it changes their lives forever and it can be traumatic and it can be you know it can you know make them you know thirsty for knowledge and want to find out more and they do really really extensive work you know again in the big cat field here we've got very dedicated researchers across the country put correlating generations of reports um, and, and doing the work and it gets dismissed as a you know as a, a stupid news story or something to laugh at or um, a, a joke and it, it you know it's, it's very frustrating to see that happen you know to the genuine people well Luke where does your brain go when it comes to something like l- let's take Nessie for instance you know do you think that there is a possibility that there's a enough of a breeding population and, and this lock is deep enough to to house things like that it's it's very tricky I mean and again the biolog the biological sort of reports conflict each other so I, I think if I think if Nessie does exist it's there's a number of things we can discount you know so it's very unlikely to be be a marine reptile like a plesiosaur um, because even you know a plesiosaur needs to come to the surface and breathe and Loch Ness is a very popular tourist spot and you know people are watching the waters all the time if there was a population of marine reptiles in there somebody would be spotting them coming to the surface and breathing and feeding and things like that a little bit more regularly than than they perhaps are what was interesting is that when we did that, uh, there was a, a study done last year which looked at the trace DNA in, in Loch Ness. And one of the things that they re- realised it was that there was, there was far more European eels in Loch Ness than, or you know, far more traces of eel in Loch Ness than there, there potentially should be. Um, now, that presents a couple of things. So one, eels could be a food source. You know, for for a large animal that that might be harboring in there, and again, one of the things that it could potentially suggest is that that Nessie is a is an oversized eel or a very large eel or an unknown you know species of eel, and that could you know explain why it's not seen regularly. You know, because eels are migratory. We know that they migrate from the Sargasso Sea and you know all the way to Ness. They go up the River Ness and things like that. So yeah, that that could explain you know a poten- uh, the enigma of Loch Ness a little bit. What I love about the Loch Ness phenomenon is that, and you know, my mum's Scottish, and you know, I, I have Scottish ancestry. You know, I I spent literal parts of my childhood on the shores of Loch Ness, so you know, it's a subject very close to my heart. I think the odds are against it being real, but 
that said, that's only in terms of the flesh and blood aspect. I think that, that it's not absolute. There is still a possibility that it, it's something like an eel or a migratory, migratory animal. And obviously the supernatural aspect of it, we know that, you know, Alistair Crowley had a, you know, the, the most evil, you know, man who connected with black magic, had a house on the shores of Loch Ness. I mean, you know, goodness knows what he might have been conjuring up. So, yeah, who knows when it comes to Nessie? But I hope I hope the legend certainly stays alive. And, I, and again, it's one of those things that I would love to be proven wrong on. I'd, I'd love there to be a Nessie. Imagine it being something conjured versus just a massive eel or something like that. That's pretty cool. I hate to say it, but I like that. No, I again, and you know, and as I say, there's there are so many myths and legends, and so many ties to sort of black magic and sort of the, the, these things that I I certainly know nothing about. So, but yeah, there's a yeah. So who knows what's what what is possible in those realms you know if we keep an open mind certainly not an area that i would you know that i've explored very much or, or would even you know have dipped my toe into you know i i you know I, as i say I, I i cling to the flesh and blood explanations where i can but that said unfortunately flesh and blood explanations do not cover everything and leaves a lot of phenomenon unexplained so do you recall the last time that there were livestock killings that would likely fit the M.O. of something like a leopard running around and killing such things? I mean, the, the, the incidents happen regularly enough for it to be, you know, regular news. Mm. You know, so so it, 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 I, I would say that what's interesting is that, so if you look at, there's a great podcast run by a researcher called Rick Minter, which is called Big Cat Conversations, and he has pointed out that actually the vast majority of big cats do not like livestock is not their natural choice, particularly sheep, because they don't like the, they don't like the, the, the wool. They, they don't like having to clean the, 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 the livestock of wool. So they tend to if they do attack sheep, it tends to be a, a last resource when there's fewer prey animals you know, in the area. Or it's, for instance, like this time of year when we've got a real cold snap, it's winter, prey is less available, they might turn to livestock. And of course, again, that, that also happens, you know, you know, when they've got cubs and they've got more mouths to feed, that sort of thing. So we can we can see those sort of correlations. So it happens enough, you know, again, the hot spots in the UK are places like Gloucestershire, the Cotswolds, Devon and, and Dorset. And again, then what you know, North Wales, which is very rural, up into you know Scotland and the Highlands, that being yeah, and the southeast, you know, where I'm based. Again, we certainly get our you know more than our fair share. So it, it's it's very they're very you know it, it does happen here, but not a month goes by where a, a potential livestock attack. You know, uh, again, on the Big Cat Conversations podcast, they discussed a stables, which gets a regular visit from a, a large black cat and um, which where they have had deer attacks happen on the same land which apparently are clearly the the, the, the work of a big cat and where a horse and a, or where a newborn foal was taken so all right so this last question is a hypothetical one and just so that everybody knows big cats are not on this list because luke has already seen one of those so that's why this hasn't made the list and if you want to hear that encounter go to itf 92 titled daughters of the darkness but okay hypothetical you can see a big and none of these you feel like your life's in danger so i don't want to get to you know how i get with my hypotheticals let's just say <laughs> it's a sighting okay we'll keep it simple a bigfoot a gnome or a dog man you can pick one of those three things to see out there yeah like you said the you know, uh, it, you know if, if 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 they're being viewed through you know, through, through the viewpoint of a challenger tank then yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have no issue with that. I mean, yeah, the the one on the wish list is, I, I mean, let's say I would I wouldn't desperately encounter any of them, you know, alone in the dark. But but I just to see a dog man in terms of so that I know what it looked like, and so that I could get my mind around what it potentially could be, what its physicality is, 
that sort of stuff so that I could just answer questions in my own mind that I because you know it's sort of you know mind bending mind blowing stuff when you even start thinking about an upright canine creature to actually see one and go okay yeah people are seeing these things and they have experienced this and they know you know knowing that, that it was out there I, I, yeah I, I, that's where I put it I've you know again I've I've pretty much experienced or I've experienced something when I was camping in California that has pretty much answered to the, 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 the Bigfoot thing for me, even though I didn't see anything. Right. Um, but, uh, but, but, and again, when I look at the Bigfoot phenomenon, so much happens and there are so many encounters and even, you know, just the small town monsters crew, you know, and, and, and just watching Seth Breedlove's journey from, a, you know, a skeptic to having something happen on his land that he, you know, that he can't explain. And the evidence that they've correlated, Bigfoot is again one of those ones where I'm like, okay, I, I, I think you know that the fact that I've gone down that that route in in my storytelling is because I'm I'm pretty certain they're they're, they're there. But the Dogman is the one where I can't explain that away too easily. Uh, so I, I'd love to see one of those. No experience with a gnome that I've ever looked at has come out well. So I have no interest in, in seeing one of those. <laughs> That's smart. Or, or, or knowing that they're around because yeah they they are you know once we get again the amount of again you know just to you know, tip of the hat towards yourself Shannon you know the the sort of encounters and experiences that you've discussed about Fay on your show and again where people have had a real opportunity to talk to you about fairly horrendous and traumatic experiences that they've had and yeah. also again more benign and perhaps you know potentially you know more amicable ones but again you know people are, are experiencing things that they can't explain and that traumatize them and you know you, you you are able to kind of come on your platform and talk about them in a way that is you know welcoming and and without judgment but i have no interest in 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 starting friendships with the fey that, none of that can work out well yeah no i i have i totally agree with you on that and and on the you know what and i think i'm i don't know whether i'd rather i i mean i would hazard to say i'd probably because i just don't shut up about bigfoot i'd probably rather just go ahead and say the bigfoot but i agree with you in that i'm of course more settled that bigfoot is likely more 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 than likely really out there we can't say for sure right we haven't seen one until we do we gotta we gotta say that because that's a smart thing to do but with the dog man i mean imagine being close enough to see it move or have it have it execute that that horrible uh, joint popping sound or something oh yeah that i mean that's the one that's stayed with me all this time like you know from the the first accounts you know the the popping hit because it comes up relatively regularly and you or does now yeah and and again it's just an odd bit of detail for somebody to make up you know and obviously once you've heard it it's easier to make up right but again but again you know it, it's just one of those things where why would somebody to, the first person you know to, who came up with that and and, and suggested the, the the hip popping thing you know that's a bizarre detail to, 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 to add to your encounter it is a strange thing to, to to add if 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 you're not thinking you know in terms of biomechanics and that sort of stuff and yeah it it just I have so many questions about given that we have these upright canine figures that you know from werewolves you know particularly prominent in European mythology and things like that I don't think we have a biological basis for them and therefore they're the one I'd want to be I'd want to see just because. It takes me to somewhere else. It takes me to it, t- it puts me on a, a different plane of existence. It puts me on a different path, you know. That takes me so far outside of my comfort zone that, you know, I'd have to start facing facts in a different way. Second to last question, and this question is totally off any topic we've covered today. But the felling of the sycamore gap tree—I don't know why, but it really, truly just made me sad to the pit of my core. I don't know why. Was no. it as outrageous for you guys over there as it was for some of us over here? I don't. It just bothered me so oh, bad that no, that happened. No, we were. I mean, that that is a, it is a true 
national landmark. It is probably the most photographed tree in England. There are people who make pilgrimages to go and see it. It was on my wish list to always go and walk Hadrian's Wall and see the Sycamore Gap tree. And I think I think it's just one of those things which it's 400 plus years old. It has always been there. Even the significance of it, you know, the silly significance of it being in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Yeah. You know, and things like that. It, so it, that suddenly it's part of my childhood, you know, and my, young, you know, my younger adulthood and things like that. And it, it, it was a truly significant tree. It was beautiful. You know, there's beautiful pictures of it taken under, you know, the Milky Way and things like that. And yeah, I mean, there were the cries in the media for what should be done to this person if we ever catch them. Uh, I, I, I know in the US you have capital punishment, but one of the things we were, some of the things that were being suggested, I hope this guy is never found because I, I don't think he'd last very long. I, I think there would be a proper mob after him. Yeah, and uh, no, I think it wounded us culturally, if, if I'm being honest. You know, it, it's it's like, it's akin to you know a few years ago when Windsor Castle caught fire or yeah. you know a national monument like that being um, deliberately destroyed and just the fact that it's a four hundred plus year old living thing and a stupid ridiculous gutter snipe of a human being decided that he would end that thing's life. Just, you know, just for the hell of it, on yeah. a whim. Just you know, an, an utter knob. I was sick when I when I read that. I thought that I was just reading something wrong or something from. Honestly, I thought it was something, some new line from a mo- movie in relation to Robin Hood or something. I didn't even put it together for a couple of seconds what had actually happened because it would just never cross your mind that any human being would want to do that. No, and they were very determined. I mean, who? I mean, I mean. Yeah, and they it's a very, picked that it's night. a very. It's a very large tree. It's not, again, it's not a case of just turning up at the car park and walking over to it. Right. You, know, you you would have to take a serious bit of equipment along about two miles worth of, of quite up and down pathway to get to it. You know, so it's, it's anything between half an hour and 45 minutes walk to get there. It probably taking a significant train shot to get to fell it the way they did. They knew what they were doing. You don't just cut a tree down right. that that well. So I, yeah, and again, I don't know what's happened. I mean, I think obviously there's a lot going on in the world at the moment. You guys, you know, you had the the capital rights not that long ago, you know, and you know some real sort of stab wounds into what you know democracy and. You know, clearly there are some very, very upset people out there who don't know how to process some of the horrible things that are going on. And, you know, I have some sympathy to that. But, but you know, if, if the way you react is to, to go out and, you know, take out a 400-year-old tree, then it doesn't bode well for the rest of us, unfortunately. No, and that's where my word apocalypse comes right back in yeah, to <laughs> close things down. Yeah, it we've had really our shot, and, and it was we've done very, very badly. So yeah, somebody else can take over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I, I keep seeing these cartoons and memes, yeah, where aliens visit, and like, you know, we've looked at it, and you know, the only intelligent life on this planet are, are dogs, you know. So it's, yeah, it's you know, sort of aliens, you know, dismissing humans because. There's no way we could be what we do to the planet could be described as intelligent. But. Oh yeah, they they come in, they take a look, and they're like, "We're out of here. There's no intelligent yeah, life yeah. here, man. There's yeah, we got nothing." But all right, so what's next for you, Luke? Are you working on some some more books, or is that top secret information? No, it's not. I mean, uh, I I always like to it's sort of James Bond esque at the end of my books. So I always like to say that the lead character character will return. And as I say, at the end of Rogue, Nina Lee will return in Southern Rogue. So yeah, with the second book, we're going to Louisiana and going to New Orleans and looking at some of the legends of the South. And I'm 10,000 words into the next Beast book, which will be the fourth in the the Beast series of the the Big Cat books, which again has taken an interesting sort of change in direction in that we're now 
the last book was set in Wyoming, and, you know, and we sort of looked at the main character there, Thomas, his past in Wyoming, and looking at uh, mountain lion hunting, where these animals are now alive and being looked after in his care. So, yeah, it's some really interesting stories to tell and explore it in the next year or so. I'm aiming to get a book out a year if I can. So, yeah, hopefully you, know, you won't have too long to wait or my readers won't have too long to wait for, for the next books as long as I'm disciplined and, and work hard. So, Which you always do. So no one should be worried about that. Well, congratulations, Luke, on that. We'll let everybody know any, any social handles you want to give out and, of course, where to find the books. Yeah, so you can best way to look at me on socials is through Black Beast Books. I am on there as Luke Phillips as well, but generally Black Beast Books is the best place to find you know stuff about my books, about my stories, and things like that. You know, my personal socials tend to be just about the places I've visited and, and what lunch I've had, so slightly less interesting than than marauding creatures. All of the books are available, including Rogue, which is the latest one, and Bigfoot based, which is probably you know. Uh, more of interest in the big cats perhaps are uh, all available on amazon on in both paperback and kindle the audiobook is being produced as you know as we speak so that you know shouldn't have too long to wait for the audiobook either so but yeah all available on amazon as we speak well lou thank you so much for coming back on let's not wait as, as long for the next visit okay no, yeah, absolutely. There's been no no more uh, sort of you know plagues or, or sort of you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, world shutdowns allowed to, to interfere with our yeah with, with, with catching up. So yeah, Re- thank you very much, Shannon, for having me on. Really appreciate it. It's been as always. It's been absolutely lovely.